Hello, everyone. Welcome to the seven questions webinar series organized by the Center for Evidence Based Blockchain, which is a consortium of universities advancing evidence based practices in blockchain and distributed ledgers. My name is Naseem Nakwi. I'm the president of the BBA and the editor in chief of the Journal of the British Blockchain Association. I'm your host for today's webinar. Um, just a couple of announcements to make before we uh, introduce you to our very special guest. Um, the aims and objectives of these sessions is to have a um, high quality discussion around blockchain related topics and uh, questions that you always wanted to ask um, from the experts. These are very bite-sized sessions, last about 25 minutes, easy to follow format, seven questions, and the guests will have uh, a couple of minutes you know, to answer each question. There are uh, no live questions, but uh, we are happy to um, uh, take any questions you have in the chat box. <clears throat> if we have time, we can put these forward to Matt. Um, the, the session is recorded and you can uh, view our uh, uh, webinars uh, on our YouTube. The, this webinar will also be uploaded later. These are audio webinars. There are, there are no videos, so you don't need to switch on your uh, camera. So um, let's get started. Today, we have with us Matt Lucas, who is uh, the advisory board member of uh, the BBA and uh, Global Blockchain Engagement uh, Lead at IBM. I met with uh, Matt um, last year uh, at the University of Manchester when he gave a talk on Hyperledger, which was an excellent presentation, very well received. The way he explains things, he's uh, an excellent teacher, and he also spoke at uh, the International Scientific Conference, which we organized in London uh, earlier this year. So we thought we should invite him again and, and learn uh, about this, uh, uh, the Hyperledger technology. So uh, Matt, very welcome, a warm welcome to the webinar. Hi Naseem, pleasure, pleasure to meet you again. So, um, at start, um, very basic question: What is Hyperledger exactly? In, 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 now, these webinars are attended by uh, uh, by non-technical people, businessmen, policymakers. So, in a in an easy to understand uh, way, what exactly is Hyperledger? How do you define it? So, uh, I guess the first thing to to understand is, is Hyperledger is is not a single technology in, in itself. It's actually the name given to a whole group of uh, blockchain projects that are uh, hosted by the Linux Foundation. Um, they all have the common aim of advancing blockchain technologies for business. Okay, so it's actually been one of the fastest growing um, sets of projects in Linux Foundation history. Um, so it's now uh, supported by nearly 300 member organizations, uh, quite a broad range of, of member organizations as well, such as technology firms, consultancies, startups, but also a lot of um, non-tech industry um, uh, members, such as banks, healthcare, construction companies, and, and so on. So underneath that, um, that banner, that Hyperledger banner, there are lots of projects that are under development. Um, so there, as, as of today, there are six frameworks. Uh, that's implementation of blockchain technologies um, and a further eight libraries and tools. Um, and when, when a lot of people talk about Hyperledger, they, they, they're often actually just referring to, to one of those technologies, you know, quite often something like Hyperledger Fabric, which is one one particular implementation underneath that Hyperledger uh, greenhouse, they call it. But there's, there's actually quite a wide range of, of, of technologies underneath that banner, including things like um, Ethereum clients now and, and things like um, libraries for uh, doing things like um, cryptographic 
um, uh, functions and identity and things like that as well. So there's a lot of stuff underneath that, that Ledger banner, but it's all hosted uh, part of the Linux Foundation. So when non-technical people, when they hear about blockchain, they, they, they've heard of Bitcoin and other public permissionless ledgers. And then we have seen this emergence of private chains. So tell us about this very fundamental characteristics of these uh, private permission consortium type blockchains. Yeah, so the, the thing, thing to remember it, is that blockchain's reach is, is far wider than, than cryptocurrencies. You think about um, the things that businesses hold dear, you know, assets, the fact that they work as part of a, a wider business network and the way that you generate wealth is by flowing goods and services over, over business networks. Um, the purpose of, of blockchain really is, is to solve some of the fundamental problems that we see with things like ledgers and contracts, um, which are the fact that there are many of them. You know, I've, if, if I do business with you, then I will record details of those transactions on my ledger and you'll record it on yours. Um, and similarly for contracts, contracts are ambiguous by their very nature and, and can take teams of lawyers and judges a lot of time to, to sort out. Um, so, so the purpose really of, of blockchain for business is to help facilitate trade. Now, you think about what the internet did for the flow of information. It allows people to communicate with each other just as easily in the next country as it is to communicate with someone in the next room and, you know, for, for, for good or for, for, for ill, right? Um, and the purpose really of blockchain for business is to try and enable trade, the, the movement of assets, the ability to do transactions as easily as it is to, to move information over the internet. Now, and your question specifically talked around things like private permission networks as opposed to the public networks that we hear about when, when talking about things like um, Bitcoin. And I think with, with Hyperledger, it, it's, it's important to separate the technology from the deployment option. Um, and, then, and specifically around, around Hyperledger Fabric, which is um, one of the more advanced um, Hyperledger projects, it is typically deployed in business to business networks where there is a need for things like privacy and confidentiality. You know, if, I, if I'm betting my business uh, wanting to, to um, include details of a transaction that, that we're doing, I, I certainly don't want to include that in a, in a public space. And I want to make sure that only those involved with the transaction get to, to see information about it. So there is, there's often a need, particularly with, with technologies like Hyperledger Fabric, to deploy it in business-to-business in -business networks. Um, specifically as well with, with Hyperledger Fabric, um, there is the concept of identity in there, and that is built into to how Hyperledger Fabric works. And, and that means that if I want to do transactions in Hyperledger Fabric, we have a set of certificate authorities, which means that when I do a transaction, I, you know it's me that did it, and, and I start signing transactions. Um, if I do business with you, you know that it's me that put that transaction there. Um, obviously, you, the, you, the requirement is to, to um, adhere to all the requirements that you, you may hear around uh, confidentiality and privacy, and you build that in. But in order to do that, you need identity. And what, what's, you know, if, you th if you think about it as well, it is fundamentally different to, to how networks like Bitcoin works. Because in Bitcoin, we talk about pseudonymity or, 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 or anonymity, you know, de depending on <laughs> um, how much um, um, uh, analysis you can do over the, over the ledger. But anonymity is, is the polar opposite of privacy. So with anonymity, you know um, something happened, but you don't know who did it. With privacy, you know who you're dealing with, but not necessarily the transaction that occurred. You know, so it is the complete opposite when we talk about business blockchains. And the reason why you need, you, you need privacy and confidentiality in, in business of blockchains is the fact that businesses, uh, most businesses, certainly the ones that, that we, we deal with, are regulated in some way. And they've all got regulations around things like KYC, you know, know your customer and anti-money laundering and combating the financing of terrorism is all requirements that require businesses to know exactly who they are dealing with. So, you know, when we, when we see businesses wanting to implement a, a blockchain, 
um, we don't see that much overlap in use cases between the, the public blockchains and, and the, the, the blockchains that are more set up to be private and, and permissioned. Yes, I think this is a this is a very interesting and very very important point. You uh, distinction you made between privacy and anonymity, and I, I, I'm sure I think that's a very very important point. Coming back to the, the very basic um, tech technological details about this achieving consensus, well, this uh, businesses, executives, and so on, policymakers. So when uh, we talk about achieving consensus. So how does this hyperledger achieves a distributed decentralized consensus? I mean, there are participants who can vote and there are, we can choose who can only have the read access, who can have the right access and so on. Yes, in, indeed. Now, so there's so two two real parts to that. And um, so, firstly, I'm, I'm I'm going to deal with Hyperledger Fabric here, because uh, again, so uh, Hyperledger itself is is a, is a group of technologies. If I, if I look specifically at Hyperledger Fabric, that there's the two things that we need to bear in mind first. First is is how you in how you achieve consensus over transactions. You know, so for those people who are familiar with things like Bitcoin, you know, when we talk about proof of work, so how, how do we how do we get transactions recorded on the ledger such that the network agrees what the the content and the order of those transactions is? And the other part of the the the, the question that that, you, that you're alluding to, I guess, is is how you achieve governance of the network. So how you can choose, for example, as you say, who has read-only access, who, who can write to the, to the ledger and so on. So if, it, so if it's okay, I'll, I'll take, take both of those. So firstly, transaction endorsements, how you achieve transaction consensus. So Hyperledger Fabric has something called selective endorsement. And this, this, this states that instead of sending transactions to the whole network, to, to verify, as we do with things like uh, Bitcoin and, and Ethereum. What we do is, is you specify a policy that says who needs to sign off on it. So if I, for example, I'm, I'm, I'm buying your car and I wanted to, tr to uh, put that transaction on a blockchain, then maybe it would be you that has to sign off on that transaction and I have to sign off on that transaction. Or maybe there's a regulator as well, like the DVLA, or maybe there's a, a payments provider or something. But we have a set of rules that say who endorses a transaction. And then what happens is and me as a, yeah. as a client connecting in and putting my, uh, my transaction on the ledger, what will happen is then you've got this set of nodes around the network. Uh, they will run the smart contract that's associated with that transaction. So there's an execute phase that starts off. Then um, the nodes on that network that have got the policy of endorsement will endorse that transaction. That means applying their digital uh, signature to it. It will then go back to the client. And the client then will um, have these, these signed copies of the transaction uh, with the output of running the, the smart contract. And then they'll be ordered. They'll be put into a block and ordered. And there is a specific thing in Hyperledger Fabric called the ordering service, whose sole responsibility it is, uh, it, it, um, is to uh, take the, the transactions and put them into a block. Then what happens is the ordering service will then produce a block, and then it will send it back to all of the nodes on the on the uh, channel we call it um, on the um, on, on the ledger, and they will all make sure all of the nodes on the network will then ensure that they've been signed correctly according to the endorsement policy. So that's the the approach that that transaction that that type ledger fabric uses to endorse uh, transactions. Now on the point around network governance, how you decide who can do what. Well, the, the, the technology of Hyperledger Fabric itself does facilitate democratic voting. So, for example, you may have a set of operators on the network that says, well, how we deal with changes to the network, how do, how do, we, how do we deal with things like onboarding onto the network? Um, maybe yeah. if somebody wants to join our network, all of us need to vote on it and, and a, a majority wins, or maybe everybody needs to sign off on it, or maybe just one operator on the network needs to sign off on it. And so Hyperledger Fabric can, uh, can certainly uh, facilitate uh, that, that process, um, which is quite an important way of, um, uh, of, of, of making changes um, happen in a, in a constructive way. Mm. Mm. No, I think this is very clear. Um, I think very, very, very clearly explained um, how it works. Now, very commonly asked question about 
uh, the how do you actually start you know using it so a question people ask is I mean, is it open source i mean can can anyone download this is this like a software somewhere how can i start using it do i need to purchase this software from 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 linux foundation or how do i get started um, firstly, yes, it is it is open source, so anybody can download and get started. All the um, all the source codes available there on on GitHub repositories. If you if you if you choose to do so, that that's totally fine. And also, the other thing about um, uh, the Linux Foundation, of course, is open governance as well, which means that anybody can contribute and, and contribute to the direction, the technical direction of, of, of the project. So anybody can download and get started. Um, you talking about running costs there as well. Obviously, every project has a set of running costs in terms of things like computing power. Now, one thing to bear in mind um, around uh, Hyperledger Fabric is I, I spoke before about this, this notion of, of selective endorsement. Uh, and that is highly efficient when it comes to uh, endorsing transactions. So if you, if your um, perception of blockchain is it's very energy inefficient, you know, taking more power than the country of Switzerland or whatever, that's that's simply not the case with technologies like Hyperledger Fabric. Because if you think about the the resource costs that are required here, if I want to to buy your car again and, and record that transaction on a uh, on a blockchain. Uh, then what I really need to do is, I, as a client, I just need to send that transaction to you, and you need to sign it and send it back to me, and we make sure that the ordering service gets it. But those are those are minimal costs. It's not like like you would you would achieve in something like Bitcoin, where you have to send the entire uh, the, the transaction out to uh, everybody to uh, to to um, endorse. And then you have to run a, a, a sequence of steps of proof of work and, and solve difficult cryptographic puzzles in order to, to get your transaction confirmed. And, and, and that's because Hyperledger Fabric is deployed in, in networks where there is identity. So you already know who you're dealing with. And so and you already have an incentive and the incentive is, is, is to do business. So, so there are minimal computer costs. Now, of course, what you're doing is if, if, I, if I compare it to something like a database, and of course, you, you are adding a number of qualities of service over the over the top of a database. You know, you you are running consensus. You, you are you do get provenance, immutability, and finality. And these are all you know, all things come at a all things um, uh, come at a cost. But of course, the benefit that you then get is from those qualities of service is that then you don't need to have a single point of trust. You don't need to trust, for example, the database administrators. You know, not to tamper with things and and, and all that. So so you are adding a number of qualities of service. There, but the, the compute costs are are are, are quite minimal. Um, now, of course, when it comes to costs, and, and and the same really goes for for most computing projects these days, is that many users will choose to delegate tasks to a business partner. You know, and that could be someone like IBM or or, or whoever, uh, and they could be hosting the infrastructure required in order to run that. Whether it's hosting the ordering service that I mentioned, or hosting the the peers that will hold a ledger, um, th those those kind of operational tasks and and that management can be delegated onto onto a a business partner. Um, and of course, what you may say is, well, actually. Um, I, you know, if I if I were to to pick an example of, I don't know, maybe I'm 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 looking at the provenance of food or something, then I may be a big company and I may want to host that infrastructure. But of course, I equally may about well be a a small company. I may be a, a farmer who's got no IT budget at all, and I you know I don't know what AWS is. You know, you you may choose to do that. And so what you can also do is you can choose to act as as a client into a a hyperledger fabric. Uh, instance where you're not hosting a ledger yourself, but you're delegating the responsibility for signing off transactions to a what we call a trust anchor, to, to someone who is who is willing to to sign transactions, as I say. And, and of course, then the trade-off is: do you want to um, do you want that? Uh, I guess the non-repudiation of being able to sign off on transactions yourself, or do you not want that responsibility at all? And then you delegate trust onto onto a, a trusted third party. It's all about trade-offs. Sure. And you, all the necessary resources are there. You, you don't need to become a member of Linux Foundation to get started. 
No, no, not at all. It's it, it's all there. Um, so one of the things we've done in IBM is is to, to make it as easy as possible to get started. Obviously, this isn't a, um, a sales pitch of IBM. Um, IBM's done it. You know, lots lots of clients. And what are they doing is they are they they're taking that that code from, from Linux Foundation and then building out an added services on top. And whether it's like in the case of IBM, whether it's adding those services and support. So, you know, we can support clients going into production on doing that or whether it's you know, adding additional technology that makes working with it easier. There, there's lots of things around to, to get started um, with, with high pleasure, but equally well, you you can take you can take the technology and and you can you can run with it today. You can build it. You can contribute. Um, that there are no restrictions on on who who can get going with the um, with the technology. Sure. Now, in in terms of uh, practical applications and, and usability, I'm aware of this uh, the IBM and Walmart um, that that supply chain cases study, which was uh, published in the JBBA. Um, what are the kind of, uh, if you were to offer uh, Hyperledger as a solution to businesses, governments, organizations, what are the top three best kind of use cases? One is, of course, supply chain. Are there any other which are well established and, 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 and up and running? <clears throat> Well, to, to pick on that point of supply chain, I, th I think it is fair to say that that um, certainly Hyperledger Fabric has has found a niche when it comes to supply chain based use cases because of the properties of things like uh, provenance that that are extremely simple to achieve in in, in this kind of uh, te technology. You know, when I look at the various supply chains that uh, that we've got. Um, Hyperledger fabric-based solutions, you know, tracking the provenance of food, tracking the provenance of, of diamonds or, or cobalt or, you know, container ships. These are all these are all variants on the theme of of bringing together business networks and, and allowing trade to be um, to be more simple. If I were to look at um, other Hyperledger projects as well, I, I would also point to Hyperledger Indy. Um, which is an implementation, a really great implementation of self-sovereign identity, um, which, I, which for me is, is really a killer use case when it comes to blockchain. Uh, this, this notion of, just simply because it solves so many problems, um, th this notion about being able to have users in, put users in control of their own identity and then to choose who gets to um, have access to components of that uh, that identity, and then what you do is you introduce this, this concept of verifiable uh, claims or verifiable credentials, as it's sometimes known, where you have a set of facts associated with that identity, and then you get something that's really powerful. Because then what you can say is, look, I can prove to you that I'm Matt because here's my here's my uh, identity, and uh, I can also, uh, I can prove to you that I, don't know, I work for IBM or you know, I'm, I'm a member of the BBA or, or whatever it happens to be. It's a fact that's associated with my identity. And that solves all manner of problems with, with identity systems as they, as they exist today, because we know that identity systems are somewhat centralized and, and we know the problems that are caused with identity theft and um, in, in, in society and, and, and single companies being in control of, of data. Whereas now, if you can decentralize that and you can say, well, hang on, uh, here's, here's a, a decentralized identity and a set of facts associated with it, you can solve things like, um, you can also solve things like the, the prevalence of, of, of fake degrees or, um, or, or, or CVs. You know, you, you know, if you can have a set of facts associated with identity, you know, potentially reveal information around where someone worked, uh, what qualifications they have, uh, and other, you know, other things like um, medical history and, and, and do it all with appropriate privacy and, and, and confidentiality. So for me, um, that, that's another killer use case when it, when it, comes, to, when it comes to blockchain. Um, the, the final thing I'd say about Hyperledger Fabric um, that well, would be a good... Sorry? So did you, did you have a question? Well, yeah, yeah, you keep going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so I'd say no, the no, final I was thing. What, um, what's the? Yes, yes, Matt. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. I'll say the final thing. Um, uh, the best use case that I'd say about uh, that I would I would always point to is just really that this idea about flexibility, um, and that we're still just scratching the surface when it comes to to good blockchain use cases. Um, you know, I do. You know, I have to say, right? I, I do 
see a, an equally number of an equal number of bad use cases as I do good ones. Um, but you know, when I look at the the real good use cases for um, uh, for high pledger technologies, you know, they all have a common set of things. You know, there's always a business problem to solve. There's always a need for um, trust, and there's always a business network. And you, you, you can boil down any of the successful use cases that we've seen with these technologies down into a set of assets, the things that you want to represent on the ledger, a set of participants in the business network that have a need to share information and have a need for trust, and a set of transactions that cause changes in state of those assets. And if you can boil down whatever use case you've got, if you can boil that down into those three things, the chances are you've got a pretty decent blockchain use case. Um, Matt, we have uh, a question from Dave Kuchelko, and he's asking about this identity management uh, use cases outside of uh, financial services. So he's asking, are there are these implemented already? The self identity cases, or this is a a, a hypothetical uh, kind of consideration at the moment, or are these practical uh, examples that have been implemented already? They, uh, so there, there are, uh, they, these exist already. Um, so you might want to check out the Sovereign Network. Um, there's a good few use cases on there. You can Google them quite easily of, of instances where we've, uh, where we've done that. Uh, so yeah, check, check out Sovereign, if I, S-O-V-R-I-N, uh, as, as a good, good example there. Um, I think the, the thing around success around blockchain, of course, is, is blockchain always relies on the business network. And that's one of the, one of the things that certainly technologies like Hyperledger Fabric have been really successful is, 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 is obtaining that client adoption. Because without, without the business mm -hmm. network, without clients adopting it, a, a blockchain is always going to be um, consigned to failure. And so getting client adoption, and, and for many use cases, is very early days. If I were to look at uh, things like Food Trust, where we've got um, over 80 clients uh, on that network now, uh, um, 80, 80 businesses. If I were to look at Trade Lens, which is all about container shipping, then more than half of the world's cargo is, is now tracked on, on this particular blockchain. So it, it reaches a point where you, where you benefit from the, from the network effect. And I think the the success of any of these blockchain projects is always going to be around the size of the network. Yeah, of course. Um, Matt, I think just one, I think we have got, but just one more question. Um, about Hyperledger, are there any credible training educational resources apart from obviously attending like your talks? Uh, uh, how should, uh, people go about learning more about this. Okay, yeah. The, so the Linux Foundation do a, a lot of really good online courses, and there is also a certification uh, that you can uh, get as well. Um, thinking a bit more parochially as well, um, some of the things certainly that I've been involved with, uh, IBM does a course called Blockchain Essentials that is all about the concepts. Uh, around what blockchain is, and there are some more uh, technical technical ones as well. Um, I've also been, um, uh, me and a couple of my, um, uh, my, my colleagues have written uh, an O'Reilly book on getting started with enterprise blockchain, so you can uh, have a go at that. Um, I also um, uh, do um, a bit of lecturing at uh, the University of Oxford as well, and so doing doing various courses there on, uh, on, on, on blockchain, specifically around um, the software engineering aspect behind it, so um, diving into the technology and again, so um, anyone can sign up to those. Um, it's in the Department for Continuing Education. So there's a lot of, lot of stuff out there, um, a lot of online courses, a lot of stuff you can find on Google. I say my, the first place I, I would certainly go to from a, a non broker point of view would be the Linux Foundation where you've got um, a whole set of, of online education and certification. Very good, excellent. Thank you very much, Matt. I think we have no more questions. We should conclude our session. Uh, I would like to thank Matt Lucas for his time. Um, it was an excellent webinar. We learned a lot. Uh, Matt, any final message for our audience before we finish? No, um, I'm always very happy to be contacted. Um, if anybody has got any uh, questions in the future, 
then you can uh, get in touch with me, um, Lucas, L-U-C-A-S, at uk.ivm.com. Uh, or you can contact me over Twitter, which is M-Q-Matt, M-A-T-T. Excellent. Thank you very much, Matt. Thank you, everybody, for joining in. Uh, record, recording of this uh, uh, webinar should be available on YouTube very soon. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Matt. Take care. Thank you, Nassim. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.